Hey there, I'm Ella from Spline. In this video, we will learn how to make this puffer fish character come to life by following our cursor, reacting to our mouse, and doing what puffer fish do best, puff up. All right, let's get started. So the first thing we're going to learn how to do is use variables. Variables allow us to trigger events that specifically change variables within our objects. So we can change the variables of the size of our object, the position of our object, and more. So let's do a simple exercise first. Let's use this simple sphere that eventually is going to be the body of our puffer fish. And we're going to create a variable using this. So create this sphere. It's going to be 500 by 500 by 500. And we want to make sure we reset the position so it's in the middle of our scene. And now we can make our variables. And we can do this in two ways. The first way is we can make sure to press escape to have no objects selected and scroll down to where you see the variable panel. Panel. Now here you can click on the four point icon and click on the plus icon here to create a new variable. And here you can see the types of variables you can create. The other way to do this is by selecting the object and then you can go to the right hand panel and approach some of the properties, like the size, and you'll notice this little plus icon appears. This means you can create a variable with this property. Click on the plus icon in the X axis. So now that I've clicked on this plus icon, I can create a new variable. You can change the name here. So let's name this size. Now I'm going to keep the value at 500. There we've created a new number variable. If we now go to the variables panel, you can see that it is there too. You can rename your variables here and right click to see the options to either duplicate or delete. But if we go to play mode, nothing happens yet. There are still a few steps that we need to take to get this first variable in action. So I want this variable to be activated whenever I'm clicking on my object. So in this case, the sphere. So let's select the sphere and create a new mouse down event. Now in action, select set variable. Using the set variable action will allow us to update the value of the variable defined by an expression. Here I chose the variable that I have created before named size. And now click here to create our expression. So you can think of the expression like defining a formula through mathematical operations to get our desired outcome. So let's do exactly that. Click here, select my variable, select the math operation add, add a new number. Here I'm going to do 32. This formula basically is saying that I want my object to add 32 to the size every time I click on it. So if we go to play mode, we can see that yes, indeed it is adjusting the size by 32, but it's only working on the X axis. This is because when I created this variable, I only selected the X axis. So if we click back on our object, we can see here that the X axis is the only one highlighted. So what can we do to ensure that this grows on all sides? Well, it's super easy. Just click on that plus icon on the Y and Z axis and select the same size variable that we created before. Now this adjustment is going to affect all of them. Oh, and by the way, the reason my sphere changes color a little bit here is because I'm using the depth layer in the material panel. As it's growing, different parts of the gradient in the depth layer are being revealed. All right, done. Now our sphere grows evenly on all sides by 32 points when we click on it. Pretty cool. Now I've added other elements to our sphere, like the mouth, fins, tail, spike, and these beautiful eyes to transform the sphere into our pufferfish. So let's quickly review each of these elements to learn how they were created. To create these spikes, it was pretty easy. All you need to do is use either a cone or you can use a cylinder, and you want to make sure that it is aligned and centered at the top of our sphere. 
So you can adjust the design of the cone here. So if you want it to be a bit sharper, you can do that. It's important to ensure that the position of this element is centered. Now to make it surround the whole body, we need to activate the cloner. So let's turn that on and we can select type. And for the type here, let's select object. And then for two object, we want to make sure we select the body of our fish, which is the sphere that we're working with. And this is what the cone clones are going to surround. So in axes, we want to change that to Y. And here on count, you can increase the number of duplicates. So this can be as many as you'd like. Then we can keep it on a line in normal and then have spread to random. You can also adjust seed. This is going to help you see various positions and options for your cones. Now for the mouth, this was super easy to make. I quickly created this using the path tool. For the flippers and the tail, you can design these using the modeling tools as we did here, or you can use the effector tool, totally up to you. Then you can adjust to create a new group and make sure you move the pivot point. This is super important. And we want to align this to the center of our fish's body. Then you can create a new group to add the animation of the movement to the fins and the tail. And it's also, again, super important that you create a new group when you're doing this. Let's adjust the pivot point in the group to the center rotation of our wings and our fin and create a new state and adjust the rotation. And then you can add a transition action with an infinite loop as we've shown you here. Now for the eyes, you can create them with a simple sphere. So these eyes must be grouped and the pivot must be aligned in the center of the fish's body. And to make the character's eyes follow the cursor, you can add the look at event. And we can adjust the value here to 2000. And we want our character's eyes to always follow the mouse and not reset. So down here, I made sure to select the no reset option. Now we just apply the same effect to the other eye. And an extra tip as well, you can adjust the eyes rotation to prevent it from exceeding a limit when it passes the cursor. Another important note is once you have your design elements ready, you can create your first group with command G then create a second group for the final position. This helps us maintain a group that will have the initial position at zero where I can then apply my variable later. Now, how do we make these elements also follow the growth of the body of the fish? Well, for example, here I have the spikes. They are already positioned, but if I go to play mode, they do not grow along with the fish's body. So what we need to do is apply a variable and also set it. After they are located and aligned and correctly on the body, I can check where I want them to grow to make sure I select the correct axis. Now I want the growth of my spikes to be in this way, only from the Y axis. So I already know that here is where I will apply my variable. So let's create a variable just for this and name it POS. This will stand for position. Let's keep it as zero. Now go back to the mouse down event and create a new set variable action. Let's keep it at 16 here.
Now, if we go to play mode, we can see how the spikes follow the growth of the body. Now, I could apply individual variables for each element, but in this case, I can keep using the same variable for the rest of the elements. And just make sure that it is applied on the correct axis, depending on the direction in which our object grows. So I will select my element and move it to where I want it to grow, and then check my position to see which axis is affected. In the case of my eye, I can see that this movement affects the Z axis. So this is where I will apply my variable for this element. In the case of the mouth, we can do the same thing by selecting the Z axis. And for the fins and tail, I'm going to do the same thing with the X position axis. Now, if I click on the body of my little fish, not only will it grow, but my elements will also do so as well. Now, in addition to my fish sphere growing, I also want the position up and down to change. Let's create a new group and create a new state, changing the Y position to the height that I want my fish to reach. You can also rotate it a little. Now let's go back to our mouse down event and we are going to create a conditional action and we can click on if and select the variable size and have it greater than or equal to 700. Now I click on this plus icon to add a transition. And then on target, I select the group where I created my new state with my position change. And in mode, I make sure to select the option, repeat each time. Then in my transition, I make sure to select the base state and state. So now we can go into play mode. Now, if I click once on the sphere of the body of the fish, it reaches the size limit we set and it will start to float. Let's change the speed here to four so it goes a bit slower. Nice. I renamed this layer as float to make it easier to identify later. After floating, I want our fish to return back to its original position and I also want it to return back to its original size. So how do we do this? For that, all we gotta do is select our fish body again and create a state change event. In object, I will choose the same group where I have my state with the up and down position, the float group. In the change to settings here, we can leave it at state. Here and then we can define what actions will happen at the end of the transition movement. So click on the plus icon here. First, create a set variable. And we're going to select our position variable and in to type zero. Create another set variable, but this time we can select our size variable and in two, add 500. Now let's add a transition action. In target, select the same group where we have the states with the position transition, in this case, float. And here we can make sure to select the state and base state. I will adjust the time here to two so that the falling movement is a bit faster when it floats. Now, if we go to play mode, we can notice that several things happen now. I click and the size of the fish increases with each click. When I reach the specific size, it starts to float and then it reaches its initial position from state to base state. Variables are pretty cool. 
A nice little touch we can add is adding a little bounce to our fish when the mouse approaches. So you can select all of the objects by creating a new group and let's name it mouse hover, just so it's easy to identify. Create a new state by increasing the size Next, add a mouse hover event and create a new transition action. In target, select the mouse hover group. For transition, select base state and state with a speed of 0.3. Then set it to spring to create this nice bounce effect. Now, when our mouse approaches the pufferfish, it also has this nice touch that helps the user perceive that something is going to happen when we click on it, right? And as always, you can export your spline scenes to your websites, and it's super easy and code-free to do. So in our export settings, I'm going to hide the spline logo, and in orbit, pan, and zoom, I will select no. You can also activate the on hover option. And after making these adjustments in the play settings, just make sure to update the link here. Then you can copy the spline viewer embed to add it to our website, or you can even export this as an experience to integrate into your iOS projects. All right, that is it for this video. We learned about variables and how we can trigger actions with specific variable changes which in this case is increasing the size of our pufferfish friend here and a few other things. We invite you to experiment with variables to create interactive scenes. There are so many different ways you can use them. You can check out our old tutorial and the information shared in the docs, all linked below. And remember, keep it simple and then do some tests and then iterate. It's a great way to learn in Spline. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye.